I'm going to begin this morning uh, by sharing out of uh, the book of Acts, chapters 27 and 28. I love the book of Acts because it's written by a Gentile physician named Luke, who is an observer and a follower of the ministry of Jesus. The book of Acts, in many ways, outlines the history of the New Testament church. The, the first portion of the book of Acts covers the ascension, the outpouring on Pentecost, and the launching of the public ministry of the Apostle Peter. The last part of the book of Acts really focuses on the Apostle Paul, his three great missionary journeys, and the spread of the gospel all throughout Asia Minor and the European continent. I love the book of Acts because it tells us not only where the church has been, but where the church can go if it would just stay true and faithful to the principles that got us here. The church was birthed in power. It was birthed in prayer. It was birthed in an outpouring of God's spirit that no man could take credit for. And the fire that begun on the day of Pentecost still burns bright in the lives and hearts of believers today. But in many ways, the book of Acts is, is a book of history. And it, it covers the finite details of the, the gospel spreading to places like Philippi and Ephesus, Corinth and, 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 and Thessaloniki and, and, and all over the book of Acts. You see Paul and his, 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 his band of, of, of brothers getting into trouble, preaching in the marketplace, getting stoned, beat up, put in prison, left for dead, only to rise up the next day and do it all over again. If you ever need uh, uh, infusion of faith and courage in your life, just read the book that details the actions of the apostles. It, by the time that you get to chapter 27, Paul is staring down the hallway of his natural life being about to end. The leader of the Roman Empire is a demonic man named Nero, who is absolutely convinced that if he can kill the apostles, he can stop the advancement of the church. What he failed to recognize is that the blood of the saints is the seed of the church. And every time they killed an apostle, 10 more were birthed. Every time that they tried to burn a church down, 10 more got planted. Every time they tried to oppose the gospel, the power of God would overwhelm them. It would pull down every high argument. It would dismantle every work of darkness. And in doing so, another family would get saved. Another person would get healed. Another dead person would get raised up. And the gospel would advance by force. But the last two chapters of the book of Acts are detailing how the story of Paul's life is unfolding as he faces certain death at the hands of Emperor Nero. And let me give you some historical context this morning. Paul's been in prison in Caesarea for two years. During that two year time period, he has appeared before three different Roman governors to plead his case. He appealed to Governor Felix but Felix refused to set him free. He appealed to Governor, in Governor Festus, but Festus refused to set him free. And finally, Paul appeals to Governor Agrippa. And Agrippa responds by saying, Paul, you have almost persuaded me to be a follower of Jesus, but I still will not let you go. And why was Paul in prison? The Bible tells us it's because he refused to stop preaching, watch, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is our faith. If Christ has not been raised, our faith is futile and we are still in our sins. If Christ has not been raised, then we will not be raised. We are dead in our trespasses and we are without hope. But if it's true that God raised Jesus from the dead, then he is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And if it is true that God has raised Jesus from the dead, then there is no fear in death for death has lost its sting. And to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And by one man's obedience, many have been made righteous and Christ will reign supreme until he has put all enemies under his feet. Oh, if Christ has been raised, it changes everything. Watch. The Romans was fine with Paul preaching a crucified Jesus. The Jews was fine with Paul preaching a dead Jesus. 
The culture was fine with Paul preaching a philosophical Jesus. But all of hell broke loose when Paul started preaching a resurrected Jesus. For a resurrected Jesus holds all of time and space in his hands. A resurrected Jesus is coming back to judge both the living and the dead. A resurrected Jesus won't be ignored, can't be avoided, and refuses to be denied. And that same Jesus that encountered Paul on the Damascus Road is the same Jesus we worship in the church of the living God today. For that same spirit that raised Christ now dwells in you and it gives strength even to your mortal body. But watch, because Paul's a Roman citizen, although he finds himself in a local prison, he's got the right to appeal his conviction to the emperor in Rome. And I want you to see this this morning. Paul's appeal to Nero will actually turn out to be the fulfillment of Paul's vision from Acts 23 where the scriptures say the following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, you must also testify about me in Rome. Hear me this morning, friend. You don't have permission to give up. It might seem impossible now, but God's already got this thing figured out. And the next time that you're tempted to give up, I want you to consider that maybe, just maybe, God has orchestrated the events of your life in such a way that your current crisis is actually an avenue of mission that God has ordained for the development of your destiny. For if Paul would have never made it to Rome, the books of Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, 1st and 2nd Timothy would have never been written. I would venture to say this morning, there are books inside of you. There are testimonies inside of you. There are God-ordained relationships inside of you that might not never come to the surface if you choose to focus on the wrong thing. But instead of Paul complaining about his circumstance, Instead, he sees it as an opportunity by which God will deliver him onto the stage of history and give him the occasion to fulfill his life's calling. No, it might not be easy where you're going. It's true, it might come with some unexpected delays and complications but we are pressing on and we are taking hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of for us. The warfares that you have faced, the battles you have waged, the storms that you have encountered only prove one thing. The enemy is terrified of your destiny for where God is taking you, it is worthwhile. And the same God who begun your journey, one day he gonna finish your journey and he is not done yet. <laughs> So Paul, get ready to be taken on a slave ship to Rome. And that's where we begin this morning in Acts 27. And starting in verse one, this is what the scriptures say. When it was decided that we would set sail for Rome, Paul and them other prisoners, they was handed over to a centurion named Julius who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. And Paul warned them, Man, I can see this voyage is going to be disastrous. <laughs> it's going to bring great loss to ship and cargo, even to our own lives as well. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. And before very long, wouldn't you know it? A wind of hurricane force. It called the Northeaster, swept down from them off of that island. See, Paul on a prison ship 
with 276 other passengers. And they are traveling from the port city of Caesarea, where I just was a few weeks ago, to the capital of the empire, a city named Rome. The trip, it should have taken about three weeks. It ended up taking over three months. It should have been a rather uneventful journey, but instead it destroyed a ship and threatened the lives of everyone who was aboard. Listen, the captain and the crew still eventually made it where they was going. There was just a lot of unnecessary heartbreak and injury along the way. Oh, it's true. Storms in your life, they are unavoidable. But maybe the biggest mistake people make today is instead of listening to God, they take right sounding advice from man and they end up fighting unnecessary battles, facing unnecessary conflict and causing unnecessary damage. Instead of listening to Paul, they followed the advice of the professionals. And I'm here to tell you, friend, the professionals in your life are overrated. Where are the people of faith? <laughs> yeah, when we planted this church, the professionals came out of the woodwork to tell us why we was wrong, to tell us it would never work. You planting in Snohomish? Ain't nobody care about Snohomish. That's the hardest place to get to. That's a cow town. It's filled with farms. You know how many parades they have? They always block the street. Really? You're going to be in Snohomish? If you want to make an impact, you better be in a bigger city. You better be in a bigger place. You better be in the bright lights. You better go to LA. You better go to Orange County. You better go to New York. It's going to happen anywhere, but it ain't going to happen in Snohomish. <laughs> But when the Lord stands near to you and his voice beckons you in the middle of the night and you get a word inside of you, you decide I am building my life not on what the experts say, not on what the naysayers say, not on what the religious folks say, but on what God said because he never failed me before and he won't fail me now. And all of his promises, they are yes and they are amen. For if God said it, he gonna do it and that's good enough for me. You got a lot of experts in your life saying you should just be an addict like your mom. You got a lot of addicts in your, a lot of professionals in your life saying you should just be dysfunctional like the family system that you came out of. You got a lot of experts looking at a lot of statistics, prophesying negativity over your life. And you ought to make today the first day that you stop listening to what the enemy has tried to negotiate over your life. The last day that you allow the words of fear or the words of man to dictate the altitude of your destiny and just decide in this moment, if I'm standing with God, even if I'm standing all alone, it'll be worth it in the end. They listened to the professionals, but they missed out on God. I'm convinced you need Pauls in your life who can see what you can't because they have walked through seasons that you haven't. Now, I know the pilot had a compass. I know the owner of the ship, he had a deadline. But the Bible says there is a, a way that seems right to a man. But in the end, it leads to destruction. Oh, there are some lessons you got to learn yourself. But the reason that God has placed certain people in your life is because they got certain experiences that you don't and they can save you from certain pitfalls that you haven't considered. Watch what the scriptures say, Proverbs 11, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Proverbs 24, for by wise guidance, you will wage war. And in an abundance of advisors, there is victory. Proverbs 28, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool. But he who walks wisely will be delivered. Proverbs 12, whoever loves instruction loves knowledge. But whoever hates correction is stupid. Now, I don't have to put my hand on a hot stove to know to cause pain. You don't got to date a Jezebel to know it'll end in heartbreak. You don't have to abandon church community to know it'll damage your soul. You don't got to commit adultery to know it'll wreak havoc on your marriage. 
You need a Paul who instructs you, a Barnabas who encourages you, a Silas who works alongside of you, a Peter who challenges you. Because if you don't have the humility to learn from the life of others, your time will be spent cleaning up from mistakes that otherwise could have been easily avoided. And watch how the story unfolds. After they had gone a long time without food, <laughs> Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice. But now I urge you, keep up your courage because ain't not one of you gonna be lost. Only this ship is gonna be destroyed. For last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me again. He said, do not be afraid. You must stand for God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage for I got a faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. I got a word for you today, friend. Do not be afraid. Keep up your courage. You must stand. For God has entrusted you with the lives of the folks who are on your boat. I love this. It's been two weeks straight of the worst storm that these men had ever seen. No one has eaten in 14 days. The ship is destroyed. Them sailors are terrified. And Paul stands up in the middle of the chaos and he says, I told you so. You could have spared yourself the damage and the loss. You could have spared yourself the starvation and the pain. You didn't listen to me then, but I imagine you're going to listen to me now because I've got good news. For last night, an angel of the God whom I serve he stood beside me and he gave me a word. And he said, you're not going to be afraid. You are going to stand. God has given you these lives. So keep up your courage for if God said it, it'll happen just as he told me. For when God stands with you, even when all of hell stands against you, you become an overcomer in Christ Jesus. I love this. Even in the, even in the midst of the self-induced mistake that a pilot and an owner of a ship make while abusing the prisoners who will one day stand before Nero, God in his great mercy preserves their life for the sake of one man who had enough courage to hear what the angel would say and build his life off of that word. Aren't you glad that you serve the God who desires mercy, not judgment? That even in the midst of your self-induced mistake, even in the midst of God saying, I tried to tell you, but you didn't listen. Even in the midst of your wayward living, even in the midst of your propensity to walk away from him when he's been walking right next to you, even in the midst of your own temptation and your sin and your falling away and your wayward living and your hard heart and your debased mind, even in the midst of doing stuff that God said, don't do because it's gonna cause you pain. That God is still close to the broken and the the contrite, he cannot ignore it. He still shows up in the middle of the dark night of your soul, even when it's the pain that you've caused. Why? Because God is not willing that any should perish. All God knows how to give is second chances. All God knows how to do is work with broken people. All God knows how to do is intervene in the chaos of the human experience. It's all God knows how to do. If God only saved you when you deserved it, you wouldn't ever be saved. If God only resourced you when you deserved it, you won't ever be resourced. If God only forgave you when you earned it, you would never be forgiven. But what we couldn't do for ourselves in the fullness of time, God sent a man named Jesus, born under the law to redeem those under the law. And while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. One person who stands with God, hear me, can change the entire spiritual trajectory of the boat that they're on. It was one man named Daniel whose stand changed the course of the Babylonian empire. It was one woman named Esther 
who stand changed the course of the Persian Empire. It was one man named Joseph who stand changed the course of the Egyptian Empire. Oh, I'm just looking for a few folks this morning who in the middle of their storm are willing to take a stand because God has given us the lives of all who sail in this region and by his grace, we're not willing to lose any of them. I believe that when the church of God gathers with the intention to worship him and minister to him, that actually what it extends over this region is a canopy of grace, favor, and blessing that even reaches people who are so far from him. Just by virtue of the church of Jesus Christ moving into a neighborhood, the grace and the mercy and the power of God begins to leak out in ways that you couldn't imagine. It begins to reach people at the end of their rope. It begins to soften up that heart of stone. It begins to call the prodigal by name. It begins to testify to the sick and the demonized and the hurting that there is healing in the house because there is a healer who is alive. Oh, just by virtue of pursuit being at 265 Pine, just by virtue of pursuit being at 47, 47th Avenue, what it does is it puts every demon in hell on notice that the kingdom suffereth violence but the violent take it by force and the gates of hell will not prevail against the advancement of the church you are God's redemptive seed planted in the northwest for such a time as this and if we could just find a couple men and women of God who are willing to take a stand I bet we would reach the entire boat with the glory of God And the story continues in Acts 28 and verse 1. After the storm, they wash up on shore. And they learn that they's on the island of Malta. The people of the island, they was very kind to us. It was cold and it was rainy, but they built a fire on the shore to welcome us. Now watch. As Paul gathered an armful of sticks, he was laying them on the fire. And all of a sudden, a viper driven out by the heat, bit him on the hand. But Paul shook off that snake into the fire and he was unharmed. The people, they finally made it to land. Oh, they just thankful to be alive. They're on their hands and knees kissing the sand. I'm so glad we washed ashore. I thought we were goners for sure. God, by his great grace, has opened up the island of Malta. And what does Paul do? He begins to gather wood to help stoke the fire so the folks can dry off. And in the middle of his good deed, a viper jump out of the wood pile and bites his hand. Now notice, notice what Paul doesn't do. He doesn't write a blog about how he was hurt by the church. He doesn't start a podcast about why he is deconstructing. He doesn't launch a GoFundMe so he can go on a sabbatical to explore his religious trauma. He doesn't say, oh, I guess it's true. No good deed goes unpunished. He doesn't start lambasting the folks on the shore. If you would only help me build the fire, the snake would have bit some of you miserable prisoners instead of biting the man of God. Instead, Paul thinks to himself, if I survive the storm, I can survive the snake. So no weapon formed against me gonna prosper. Every tongue which rises against you in judgment, God will condemn. If you pick up a serpent in your hands or drink poison, it will not harm you. It may strike my heel, but I'm gonna crush its head. Listen, friend. When God begin to light a fire in your life, it'll cause everything that doesn't belong to come out and lash out on its way out. <laughs> the Bible says the viper, he was driven out by the heat. That viper, he was okay to live under that wood pile as long as them islanders would let him. 
He was okay to make his home with his little snake family as long as nobody dared to light a match. He was nice and he was safe and he was comfortable. But as soon as Paul began to build a fire, that which didn't belong, it jumped out and bit him on the wrist. And can I tell you, when God began to light a fire in your life and when he began to light a fire in a church, it'll drive out every impurity that doesn't belong because what God desires for you is a holiness and a righteousness that will cause you not just to burn for a good time, but to burn for a long time so that the next generation will rise up and call you blessed so you can raise your kids in revival and leave a legacy of what it looks like to be a burning one on the altar of God. See, this is why a lot of people love to hang out in dead churches. Because it's comfortable until you turn up the heat. They love to hang out in dead relationships. Because it's easy to avoid dealing with your drama until the heat get turned up. That's why people love to hang out in lethargic spirituality. Because as long as the heat don't get turned up, the vipers that have poisoned your life are safe to stay. But as soon as a man or woman of courage doesn't just gather the wood, but has the strength to light a match, it'll cause everything that doesn't belong. It came in one way, but it gonna run out seven ways. And it'll cause everything that's been hiding to be exposed so that God can have dominion and preeminence in every part of your life. Listen, when the viper bites, you've got two choices to make. I can hang on to it and make it part of my identity, or I can shake it off and focus on my destiny. See, if I don't shake it off, I'll end up carrying it around. And if I carry it around pretty soon, that thing begins to impact my identity. Hear me, friend. You can experience pain without becoming a victim. You can experience sickness without developing a spirit of infirmity. You can face betrayal without developing an orphan spirit. It is what I do after I've been hurt that determines how long I'm gonna stay in my pain. But Paul shook off that snake. See, I've been bit more than a few times pastoring here in the Northwest. They bit me when we reopened during COVID. They say, you're killing grandma. I said, well, you killed babies for 40 years, but you don't ever talk about that. They bit me when we opened a campus in Seattle. They said, oh, you're just the next mega church pastor. <laughs> they bit me when we did Easter in the stadium. They said, oh, you a heretic. <laughs> See, here's what I found. Getting bit is unavoidable because that's the price we pay for building a fire on the beach. But I learned the art of shaking things off because I refuse to allow the pain around me to speak louder than the God inside of me. We are shaking off despair. We are shaking off shame. We are shaking off sickness. We are shaking off old habits. Why? Because when you know where God is taking you, it gives you confidence to shake off what doesn't belong on your journey. Now watch, let me in here. Now the people waited for him to swell up and suddenly drop dead. <laughs> See, that's how you know you got miserable friends. <laughs> Nobody offered to grab the med kit. <laughs> Nobody offered to suck the poison out of his hand. He got bit, they said, oh, he a goner. <laughs> I, got, I got 10 bucks, he don't last 10 minutes. <laughs> He gonna swell up and drop dead. See, here's what I found. When you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God will reveal 
in your life what type of relationships you need going forward. He'll reveal everybody who's just there for a good time versus the brothers who walk with you who are there for a long time. He'll reveal every fake, false relationship that was just attached to what you could provide for them and all of a sudden reveal who's really with you even when you find yourself down in the trenches of life. And I'm telling you, sometimes it is actually the grace and the mercy of God to allow a viper to bite because it'll reveal more about your relationships than you ever considered. And all of a sudden, what you'll find is the people who stood up and helped you stand up too. You'll find the people who said, you and the miry clay, let me pick you up and put you on my shoulder. You'll find the good Samaritans who are willing to get off the side of the road, bandage you up, and make sure you get to safety. All of a sudden, God will begin to reveal exactly the type of relationships you need to get where you're going. Notice, notice, following God didn't exempt Paul from being bit by the viper. However, it did prevent Paul from being poisoned by the bite. I might be hard pressed, but it's poison will not crush me. I might be perplexed, but the poison of despair will not haunt me. I might be persecuted, but the poison of abandonment will not damage me. I might be struck down, but the poison of that strike will not destroy me. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. You want to live for God? Good. Your life will be filled with both beautiful and painful things, often at the same time, because that is the experience of being human. But here is what Christ provides. The ability to have a testimony of all the times you should have been taken out, all the times you should have given up, all the reasons you should be depressed, all the reasons you should be an addict, all the reasons you should be in poverty. But when Christ was on the cross, he drank the cup of sin's poisoned wrath. And today you are free from death, hell, and the grave. You may have been bit by the viper of abuse, but today is the last day that that poison gets to dictate your destiny. You may have been bit by the viper of divorce, but today is the last day that poison gets to dictate your destiny. You may have been bit by infirmity. You may have been bit by abandonment. You may have been bit by that tragic family system, but because of the cross, those snakes no longer have venom. And today you're shaking it off because what God has in your future is greater than what you've done in your past. That's the God we serve. That's the hope we have. That's the goodness of God in the land of the living. We're going to Rome. We're standing before Nero. And we will preach a resurrected Jesus. Come on, friend. Let me pray for you today. Father, now in the mighty name of Jesus, we ask for your ever-present help in our time of need. God, I pray that your salvific power would begin to reverse the curse of every poisonous bite that we've encountered. Oh God, I pray that you would change our perspective. God, that you would shift our focus. And in doing so, we would set our eyes on the prize, not the tyranny around us, not the trouble within us, but the God who holds it all together above us. And God, today, we submit to your calling, to your leading, to your saving power. We say, do your best work in us. And God will be faithful to continue to stir the fire in the Pacific Northwest. To God be the glory in the church throughout all generations, both now 
and forever. And all God's people said amen and amen. Come on, friend.